Boston Girls. A special hello goes out to the director of media for the Boston Girls alumni, Mr. Mark Boyer. Nice to see you, Marky. Welcome to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the home of behind-the-scenes interviews, stories, and memories that celebrate the heritage of the great game of hockey. The Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast is hosted by Mark Willand. Centered and back to the blue line. Here's Paul Coffey with a drive. The bang is the rebound. Bill Bork wins it for the Penguins in OT. Coffey feeds it through. Bork taps it in. And it's a 7-6 Pittsburgh win in overtime. The old two-niner. Phil Bork is our guest on episode 35 of the PHA podcast. Phil Bork played 18 pro seasons. He is best known as a key member of the 91-92 Stanley Cup champion Pittsburgh Penguins. The grit, hustle, and toughness of foot soldiers like Phil, Troy Loney, and Bob Airy were crucial elements to the success for this star-studded Pens team. Phil recalls his passion for becoming an NHL player and the many obstacles he faced en route to making it to the top. He takes us behind the scenes with revealing stories about Mario Lemieux, Scotty Bowman, Badger Bob Johnson, and many others that helped make the early 90s Penguins one of hockey's all-time great franchises. Phil is also candid about his upbringing in Massachusetts and the complex and rocky relationship he had with his father and the impact it had on his life. A popular broadcaster with the Penguins and a riveting motivational speaker, Phil Bork delivers one hour of entertaining and often inspirational recollections of a hard-won and rewarding career. Now, let's talk classic hockey with Phil Bork. We're back on the show with a Massachusetts native, but a true Pittsburgher, a man who's earned five Stanley Cup rings uh, as a player and employee of the Pittsburgh Penguins, number 29, Phil Bork. Phil, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. And uh, you're right. As a little kid uh, growing up in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, my dream was from probably five years old. All I wanted to do was play in the NHL. I don't know why, because my dad, who actually went to Boston College, couldn't even stand up on skates. But I had this passion. I don't know where it came from, but uh, I just love the game of hockey, and I still do. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, you grew up in the, the Bobby Orr Bruins era. Were you a Bruins fan back then? That was the peak of it. Wait, you're around my age, so that was the actually the peak of the Stanley Cups in the early 70s of the Bruins. Absolutely, and that's yeah. That's when my my passion really went to another level because uh, I was born in '62. So when they were winning cups, you know, I was uh, uh, just about to become a teenager, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the oldest of three boys, and that was the ritual around the house. That uh, you know, my mom would make popcorn, we get the cushions <laughs> off the couch, we get our pillows from our bed, we all get around Channel 38, and we hover around and watch every single Bruins game. That's right. Nothing like Channel 38. You know, the unique thing about it back then, with a lot of people don't appreciate it around uh, America, is that the Bruins were the only team who used to broadcast nearly all of their games. You know, back then, teams would do a handful, but the Bruins did about right. 72, including the West Coast games. And so if you, and it just happened to coincide with having the incredible Bobby Orr and having such a great, colorful team. Uh, that captured all of our imaginations, and it all, you know, the impact of it was not only for you know people like you who played, or someone like myself who worked in league, but also all the rinks that were were getting built locally. Um, it was, uh, uh, and then you see the the U.S. Olympic team in 1980 with those Massachusetts kids, and that impact was was incredible. It's, but you got to live that dream um, yourself. But again, it starts out in, in Chelmsford. So you you're saying you know early on almost freakishly that you have a goal at an extraordinarily young age. You want to play in the National Hockey League. Uh, tell me a little bit about where did you play yeah, high school hockey, or did you? I did, but I only played my senior year, really. I, I played a little bit in my junior year, but I was you know, playing for uh, also for the New England Wallace Wallopers. I don't know if oh, you remember yeah, that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Out of, uh, yeah, out of... Uh, out of Fitchburg, yeah, and uh, the old Wallace Arena. I don't right. know if it's still standing or not. I don't but, know. Uh, I was still a young kid. I was playing when I was 
you know, 16 years old and I was playing uh, against or with guys that were, you know, with facial hair, with licenses, you know, that were able to drive to the games. And I was uh, <laughs> just a, a sophomore in high school. Wow. Um, but I'm glad you brought up those Bruins back in the day because what a lot of people don't realize is, you know, back then in the 70s, there wasn't a lot of U.S. kids playing in the NHL. Right. And, uh, you know, obviously what, what the Olympic team did in 1980 – not only influenced me, but tons of kids in that Massachusetts area. And it kind of, it put me really um, steered my, my compass, so to speak, to play professional hockey because my dad was hell bent on me uh, getting a college scholarship. That's all he really wanted was so that he wouldn't have to pay for college. That <laughs> this would all uh, come together. Whatever happened after that was really never even talked about by him. It was by me. Because I wanted to play in the NHL. I wanted to be like Bobby Orr and mm-hmm. Phil Esposito and Kenny Hodge and all those guys, Wayne Cashman. And uh, it, was, it was a different direction I wanted to go in than what my dad wanted me to go in. But absolutely, mm-hmm. the, those teams winning in the early 70s, the Boston Bruins, and then the U.S. team winning in 1980. I, mean, I remember that really, and I graduated in 1980 from Chelmsford High School, mm-hmm. uh, where I just played my senior year. And just a quick funny story is, um, you know, that, that was a time when Chelmsford High School was no more for football than hockey. Right. So we uh, were in the Merrimack Valley Conference, and we ended up going all the way to the quarterfinals in the state tournament, which you remember, that got you to the Boston Garden. Right. Which was, you, you can't, I can't, I can't even put into words what our high school was like at that moment. It was, it was <laughs> frenzy. It was, it was off the charts excitement that a Chelmsford High School hockey team was going to the Boston Garden. Are you kidding me? <laughs> right. And so we ended up playing, um, oh, boy. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the school that we remembered. It's not that, that important, really. Uh, Hingham. Uh, and uh, Hingham beat us in the quarterfinals. But that was uh, uh, maybe down the road here we could talk a little bit more. That really, that moment there playing in that game in the Boston Garden really took my career to a whole other direction, which I never expected. Well, it had to be an incredible experience, one that most people don't have, especially as a high school kid in Boston at that time, uh, to be there on the ice uh, performing in the Boston Garden. Now, you were able to, again, your focus is pretty much single-minded, it appears, at that point. And with that in mind, you make a decision. Now, you were, were a talented kid. Of course, you had options to go to college, uh, be part of national program or whatever, but you decided to pursue a career um, in the OHA uh, with the Kingston Canadians. Uh, Phil, how did that all transpire? How did you first get in, in contact with them? How did it transpire that you made that decision to go to Kingston? Well, your timing is impeccable. It's because of that game in the Boston Garden. And here's that story I was going to tell. Uh, <laughs> and this is unbelievable. I tell, I do a lot of public speaking around the Pittsburgh area, and I I use this part uh, in my public speeches um, about perseverance, about dedication, about seizing the opportunity and how sometimes opportunity almost only sometimes knocks once and you have to take full advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And this is the more I tell this story and I've told it hundreds of times and even telling you right now, I still unbelievable what happened to me is Jean Rattel. You remember the great Jean Rattel, Mm -hmm. gentleman, John uh, (laughs) was playing for the Bruins kind of wore towards the tail end of his career and he was at the game when we played Hingham and saw me play. And um, kind of a mutual friend was Bob Kendall, who was uh, one of the top scouts for the Boston Bruins at the time, a good friend of Jean's. And they got talking, and uh, Jean was asking Tyndall about me. And we had a, other mutual friends. <clears throat> and next thing I know, to kind of fast forward through the story, next thing I know, Jean Rattel is sitting in my living room in front of the fireplace <laughs> with Bob Kendall, my mom, my dad, and me. We're all hovered around the coffee table. And John is just, you know, saying, hey, I saw you play. thought you were a really good hockey player. What do you want to do with your career? Sure, my dad pipes up, and he's doing all this about, you know, this school and that school and like to get a scholarship and blah, blah, blah. He turns to me and says, what do you want to do, Phil? I say, John, I want to play professional hockey. I want to be in the NHL. He said, well... I have a friend. His name is Jim Morrison. He's the head coach of the Kingston Canadians. Mm-hmm. And I know that there's a rule that says you can go up there for 48 hours, 
tryout. And as long as you don't stay longer than 48 hours, you keep your amateur eligibility. You can still play college hockey. So I went up to Kingston. I tried out. After 48 hours, Jim Morrison calls me in his office. He said, Phil, wow, I thought you were outstanding. I'd love to have you play here. What do you want to do? Uh, I said, hey, coach, can you write down the names of all the players I just gave against that have been drafted by NHL teams? Mm -hmm. And it was probably five or six guys. I kind of knew who they were. And you got to remember, I'm a little bit of a cocky 18-year-old kid at the time. <laughs> he he gave me, gives me this piece of paper with all the names, the teams, the, round, the rounds they were drafted in. I looked at this piece of paper. I put it back down on the, on the table, turned it around, pushed it back to him. I looked him square in the eye. I said, Coach, I'm as good, if not better, than every single one of those players. I want to stay here. He said, that's good enough for me. He reached in his pocket, gave me $300 in cash, said, go, go you know, buy toiletries or whatever you need. Call your mom and dad, tell them to send your clothes or anything else you need and tell them you're not coming home. And honestly, I, I really, I haven't been home since <laughs> on, on any kind of consistent basis since that day wow. uh, in 1982. Incredible. You know, I never knew this story would take a turn of Jean Rattel sitting in uh, in your home. That's, that that instead, if it, all, if it all ended right there, that would be great. Jean, one of the classiest <laughs> and players to ever play the game, a Hall of Famer, obviously. And uh, But you again, seem to have at that point an unusual amount of drive. You know, once you uh, burn the boats behind you, so to speak, and said, hey, this is what it, I'm doing. I'm going to Kingston, where you played uh, one, one year with one of our recent guests, Bernie Nichols. Um, what was that experience like going from for the Wallace Wallopers slash Chelmsford High School to junior hockey? Different deal. Everybody's pretty much focused um, on, on getting to the next level. Uh, what was that like of a transition for you uh, going to Kingston on, uh, as far as playing is concerned? Yeah, first I got a quick story about Bernie Nichols because Bernie and I lived together <laughs> with the Billet family. Uh, mm -hmm. We lived in a basement together, no windows, uh, but we loved it because we were on our own. And uh, Bernie was with the LA Kings. He was a uh, uh, you know outstanding junior player. He got a forty thousand dollars signing bonus. Uh, and with that signing bonus, he bought himself a brand new Trans Am, bright blue, uh, with a bright blue interior. And uh, the family that we lived in with uh, had two uh, companies or two businesses. One was uh, a dual drive-in for the summer, and their winter business was a fur uh, store. So they sold fur coats. Mm -hmm. Bernie and I did an ad for them for Christmas time, and in lieu of compensation, we both got fur coats. <laughs> so can you imagine this? These two. You know, Bernie from uh, some hillbilly town in Ontario, West Guilford, with <laughs> trapping is their main business, and me from Chelmsford, we both have full-length fur coats driving a Trans Am to play junior hockey. <laughs> to, more, to get to your story, um, it was it was a real eye-opener for me. I was I was dinged up. I, I think I broke my wrist my first year uh, because it was just I wasn't ready for the physical play uh, of really feeling like I was playing against men, no mm -hmm. longer playing against boys. Right. And um, it was a it was a big opener, why uh, eye opener for me. And um, you know, after that first year, it was the first year I ever really worked out. You know, I never really got in the gym and and really pushed myself. Um, and the next year, I had a pretty good year, mostly playing defense. Uh, as you know, I played both forward and defense my right. whole career, uh, from junior, from high school, junior, all the way up to pro. But uh, it was a real uh, eye opener for me. And I ended up getting an agent, and he told me I was going to get drafted, and um, you know, that was, uh, that's another whole chapter in my life it's that, you know, I felt like I had a good enough, uh, draft year, uh, that I was going to somehow fulfill my dream and get drafted. Mm -hmm. But as it so happens, your perseverance is tested again, because now, uh, as I recall, you weren't drafted, although you were approached by NHL teams after the draft. Uh, am I accurate with that? I, I, it seemed to remember the Bruins were one of those teams that was pursuing you when you were through in Kingston. Yeah, you're exactly right. I got two phone calls uh, a little after the draft, and uh, that's another quick story. I remember right after the draft, um, and I was actually working at a golf gas station at uh, the, the um, Drum Hill in Chelmsford, and uh, <laughs> there was no cell phones back then. My agent was calling me from the draft. So I talked to this team. I talked to that team. You're going to get drafted here, get drafted there. But you're right. I, I didn't get drafted. But shortly thereafter, I got two phone calls. One was from the Bruins, and the other was from the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, and both of them were 
pretty much the same conversation of, hey, Phil, we saw you play junior hockey, saw you didn't get drafted, we can't offer you a contract, uh, really can't offer you much of anything except a couple nights in a hotel, a little bit of meal money, and a chance to try out, basically a walk-on. And so I ended up picking the, uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins because if you remember back in those early 80s, the Penguins didn't have that strong of a team. Right. The Bruins were really starting to come on you know, with Ray Bork on the backside. And I thought I just had, number one, I thought I had a better chance of making the NHL through the Pittsburgh Penguins than the Boston Bruins. But really there was an undercurrent to all of this. Mark was uh, my relationship with my dad, which was um, abusive, uh, tumultuous, um, combative, however you want to word it. Uh, it was it, it was really spiraling out of control mm-hmm. uh, with the physical and uh, physical and verbal abuse, and I really felt like I gotta go. I got I gotta get out of here, and I gotta spread my wings. Well, that was a mature decision to make under significant duress, and I guess. When you say that, it's it's uh, very poignant because you're a young man, and even though you're already starting to have success in in your life, that need to get yourself out of a, a, a stressful situation and make your own mark and separate yourself from your your parents. I mean, I know it's an age old story, but uh, obviously a big decision for you at, at that time, and one that actually changed your entire life as we. Fast forward to all these years later, and you're you you remain in in Pennsylvania. Uh, my my question is: through all of that, Phil, that tumultuous time that you referred to with with your father, and I say this, I'm a parent of a teenage boy myself, uh, and I'm always like I'm always checking myself: am I pushing too hard? Am I too demanding? Yeah, right, that, no, too. that that all thing. But my my question is: through that all, two questions. Um, did you end up getting uh, at any point in your life going forward some sense of peace or reconciliation with your father after that time? Well, it took a while. Um, and really through my first, uh, um, basically my first eight years, um, my career was really up and down. I, was, I spent a lot of time in the minor leagues and come up to Pittsburgh for a cup of coffee and then back down. And uh, to be quite frank with you, I, I was happy being a pro mm-hmm. uh, and just getting a contract. And I knew that way I didn't have to drag my ass back to my dad and, you know, basically say I failed. Right. Um, so that was motivation for me. But when I really got tired of riding the buses in the American league and what really wanted to succeed and really dedicated myself off the ice to my conditioning, that's when I was able to make the next step. Uh, but during that time, and maybe because I was having success and, you know, a lot of times success breeds power and, and confidence and all that, my dad and I continued to drift apart to the point where uh, just before winning the Stanley Cups in 91 and 92, we had a fallout, and uh, we didn't speak. In fact, we didn't speak for 10 years Wow! Uh, between 1990 and when I retired in 2000. So uh, it's a shame because uh, and he's no longer with us. He passed away probably five or six years ago. But the point of the story is that all the – and he did – don't get me wrong. He did a lot of good. My dad built a rink in the backyard – didn't make much money, somehow found a way to get me the best equipment on the best teams, travel here, travel there. Um, but because of all the bad he did, uh, he was not a part of my life when I won the two Stanley Cups as a player. Uh, in fact, uh, it took me uh, uh, finding somebody in my life. Um, I'll just give you his name is Sonny, uh, just a, a friend of mine, an older friend of mine that taught me a lot about forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And uh, it took uh, until I actually retired in 2000 to reach out to my dad and we finally um i don't know if we we got to a, a great place but we got to a place where we were able to talk have some kind of a relationship go golfing you know be mm-hmm. around uh, for holidays he got to know his two grandkids before he passed away and so you know that's uh you know it's, it's just kind of my whole life to be honest with you it's there's been a lot of good there's been a lot of bad um and it seems like uh, you know I had to go through a lot of bad before the good. And I think anybody, a lot of people listening to this will can relate to it. And my message is don't do what I did. Don't go through that. Everybody has somebody in their life, whether it's a friend or a family member that something has happened where you've had a fallout. My message to you is pick up the phone, Mm -hmm. pick up the phone, reach out to them, call them, air your differences. Maybe the relationship goes south. Maybe it 
goes north. Maybe it just stays neutral. Maybe you, you just have like my dad and I had, just kind of a, a distant relationship, but it's something because when they pass away, that's it. There's no chance to, to, to go back and say, I wish I, ca- I had or wish I had picked up the phone. Be, be the bigger person. Pick up the phone because it's, it's food for the soul, man. It'll make you feel a lot better if you're the person that makes that first step forward. Absolutely. And, you know, that's advice that I'll personally take myself because there are people in my life who, as you said, you take it for granted, but you're not here forever, and nor are they. So uh, I appreciate you sharing that with uh, myself and our audience. And you talked about, Phil, some of that up and down. And you, again, I go back to the same theme of yours is you, in order to do what you did, because nothing was handed to you now as a pro, uh, you had to work your tail off and do it for a long time. When you leave Kingston, you sign with uh, Baz Bastien, signs you with, with the Penguins. We talked a little bit about that first Kingston experience, but what's it like now going to training camp with a National Hockey League team? Well, training camp was in Johnstown. Uh, and it was the, the old War Memorial where anybody who's ever seen Slapshot uh, <laughs> would recognize that rink. And um, I'll be honest with you, I borrowed my mom's 1978 Mercury Cougar, and I piled a bunch of stuff in there, including my hockey equipment. And I remember driving through the Squirrel Hill Tunnel here in Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. and it, it's all of a sudden it opens up and you see the whole skyline. And I tell you what, man, it was emotional for me. I just looked at that skyline, and I was like, I'm home, baby. Isn't that incredible? I I don't know why. No, it's incredible because I had the exact same experience when I went to Pittsburgh, which I consider to be one of the great – I would have lived the rest of my life there had my career had gone in that direction. I loved it. But what you remember is coming out of that tunnel – I know Mary Lemieux tells that first story. It's very, very striking. Such an underrated city, especially back then, and it was a beautiful place that you've called home. But I'm sorry I I interrupt your, your story about training camp. No, 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 that's fine. No, I'm, I'm glad you interjected because you're right. It's it's a, just such a unique town like none other that all of a sudden you come through these tunnels and bam, there's this <laughs> skyline. And for some reason, I felt like this is where I belong. I, you know, I'm I'm proud to be a Bostonian and, and, and born there, but Pittsburgh's my home and there's a reason why I'm here. And um, for some reason, that training camp, and again, it gets back to my relationship with my dad, is I aired it out, man. I brought it. I gave everything I possibly had, and I was going to be noticed. Come hell or high water, I was going to get noticed at that camp, and I was going to get a contract, and I was not dragging my butt back to my dad to say, oh, I didn't make it. Because remember, I burnt my amateur eligibility by going up to Kingston. There's no turning back and playing college hockey anymore. Right. And so I end up up getting a contract, a two-way contract, a three-year deal with Baz Bastien, the, the general manager at the time, and uh, it was it was an eye again another eye opener because then you're you're playing against established NHLers and uh, uh, you know a lot of it I'll be honest with you looking back on it now a lot of it was just the God given skill that I had I could always skate I didn't have the best hands in the world but I could always skate and as I went up in levels that's the one thing that helped me survive was uh, the ability to skate. Right, and you had toughness and versatility too. Uh, so you had three things going for you, but despite that, it's not an easy road to get to the National Hockey League. You end up in Baltimore, uh, where you become a, a, a fixture there. When I think of Baltimore back in those days, I think of two things or three things. And one is always you had some real strong teams down there, to say the least. You had a lot of young kids like yourself, Troy Loney, Bob Airy, uh, Dave Hannon, guys who were on the cusp, we go up and down, like we're on the cusp of having real good NHL careers. And then you had some real classic, colorful, the Bernie Wolfs, Gary Rislings, and guys like that. An interesting mix of guys. I guess I, I just would, would ask you in general, the rough and tumble American Hockey League of those days, uh, talk a little bit about that experience of being a Baltimore skipjack. You're right. It was a great place to play uh, minor league hockey in a major league city. I mean, you had the Orioles, you had the Colts were there at the time. And uh, it's a funny story is the first year we actually shared uh, that Baltimore skipjack team was shared between Pittsburgh and Boston. Mm-hmm. So Boston sent down Marco Barron, Larry Melnick, uh, Mike Gillis. In fact, uh, Stan Jonathan came down right, and actually right. played some games. And so <laughs> it was unbelievable. For me, and I'm still I'm still a kid. I mean, I'm 20 years old, 
uh, and uh, and I I grew up. I grew up in a big, big way, and mm-hmm. I saw things that I never thought I would see. And <laughs> I mean, it was old time hockey back then. I mean, road trips because we were such a southern city that we had some long road trips. We had an unbelievable rivalry with Hershey, where every game was a brawl. I'm talking five on five. You hope you just didn't pick the wrong guy. Right. Uh, and it was like it was like slap shot. I remember Archie Henderson. That's a name for the oh, past. Boy. Yeah, I got oh, yeah. into a stick swinging with him, a stick swinging uh, event with him. That to this day, I still can't believe we weren't suspended for five years. It was just so nasty, and that's that's just what it was. You, you had to learn to survive, and you had to grow up real quick. And um, I, I'll be honest with you, I had fun. I, I was I was a kid. Uh, you know, I, I got a five thousand dollars signing bonus from Baz Bastien, and again, I, I was a cocky young kid back then. I took that five grand, which was after taxes, what's probably about thirty eight hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. I plopped it down on a Corvette. You know why? Because I was living the dream, playing professional hockey. And so I, I'm for years I could fit everything I owned in that Corvette driving up Route 95 to go back home <laughs> to Boston. But it, it was it was living La Vida Loca, man. It was you were living the wildlife. I don't mind telling the story. I did everything that you ever thought you would do as a professional athlete. I had fun, man. I had fun on the ice, off the ice. I liked living on the edge. Mm-hmm. Uh, I liked going out late at night and then playing guilty the next day. Uh, that's just the way it was back then. It's nowhere as close to that anymore. These guys treat their bodies like temples, which is great. But back then, it was all about work hard, play hard. Absolutely. Well, it had to be, I don't know, I look at it, and I, when you're playing in that type of environment, at Archie Henderson, I mean, six feet, six inches tall, and I think everybody who played against him has some sort of an Archie Henderson story. But when you're playing with guys like that, against guys like that, um, what uh, role does fear play? I mean, in other words, you're getting, you're going into Hershey. It's a Saturday night, and the place is packed, and you know they're they're, they're gunning for you. You know what's going to happen, and you know you're going to get involved physically. Is, is there is there a a point where you you say you have to get yourself you know mentally prepared to go out there, or are you just gung ho and ready to go? Uh, I'm just curious what that mentality because I know I'd be a little, you know, I'd be a little intimidated yeah. in some of those circumstances. Absolutely. Fear was a major role in those games. You'd be skating around and warm up and there'd be guys shooting pucks at you. There'd be guys skating by going, I am going to kill you. And they, you actually believed them. It wasn't like, oh yeah, sure you are. No, there were guys, they really want to physically kill you. And you always, you learn to have your head on the swivel because you never knew who was going to sucker punch you from the back of the, the head. And mm-hmm. again, you, you, you think about it and it was a different world back then. And you, you, uh, you grew up quick. And you learn how to not only defend yourself, but, uh, you know, to be able to push back. Uh, it, just, it just makes you who you are today. And that's why I, I truly believe that, that any company, I don't care if you're talking about computers or you're talking about, um, you know, any kind of business, that uh, if you hire a former hockey player, you're going to get a quality person because if he can play a long time uh, in the different uh, levels of, of minor league hockey and persevere through all that, Everything else is pretty easy in life compared to that. And you go through injuries and you go through a lot of uh, uh, bumps and bruises and aches and pains and black eyes and, um, you know, guys that really were in- intimidating people um, that, uh, that make you grow up real quick. Yeah, and you have to be, you know, I always say hire a hockey player. I know I'm a little bit uh, biased, but you um – you go through uh, so many ups and downs and the perseverance and the accountability that you have for your coworkers in this circumstance, your teammates. <clears throat> in hockey, you've got to be accountable to your teammates because, you know, without each other, uh, you know, especially back in those days, you know, that, that was very, very, very key. And the camaraderie that you had. And I, I'm curious about the... I get to know Troy Loney very well in my, my years in Pittsburgh. What was incredible about Troy Loney, by the way? You see a picture of him now in 25 years ago. He looks exactly the same. 
But um, I, dig- exactly. <laughs> I digress. But I look at the guys like him, you know, Bob Airy, uh, another uh, extremely hardworking player. Talk to me a little bit about the relationship because you guys had similar experiences. Again, nothing was handed to you. You had to really work your way uh, from Baltimore uh, up to uh, the National Hockey League level. Talk to me a little bit about that relationship with uh, with those guys and the, and the, the bond because that we're going to get into it in a second. But you guys were so crucial to those Stanley Cups but it had to be extra satisfying with all you had to go through together to get there. Absolutely. Uh, and that bond and that friendship I have with guys like Bobby Arie and Chirilone that you mentioned um, is everlasting. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. We won't see each other. Well, Bob and I see each other now because he's uh, the color man on the TV side for the Penguins. And I'm now uh, the radio color man. So we see each other a lot, but you know, I'll, a year will go by and I won't see Troy. and will be like yesterday. And it's, it's interesting because all three of us were left wingers, uh, all different paths that, you know, Bob Erie's from Peterborough, Ontario, a first round pick. Troy Loney's from Bow Island, Alberta, in the middle of nowhere in God's country. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I believe he was a third or fourth round pick. And again, I was undrafted from Chelmsford, Mass. And we, it's funny, as much as we were competing against each other, we were really pulling for each other. It's a, a weird dynamic because we're all down in Baltimore. We're all striving for the same thing to get to the, NHL to the Pittsburgh Penguins, but we all helped each other. You know, we didn't undermine each other. We, we pulled for each other. We pushed each other. And that's what I loved about Bob and Troy. And, and, and the list goes on uh, of other guys I played with in Pittsburgh that, uh, and I think we, we talk about any championship team that there's this check the ego at the door mentality uh, and that you're brutally honest with each other and you don't need a head coach coming in the locker room. And I had no problem going across the room to Bob Ear and go, hey, Bob, get your butt going, man. Let's go. You're mm-hmm. not doing anything out there. And he tapped me on the pads and go, and, uh, you know, he, he tapped me on the pads and go, hey, Borky, thanks, man. I needed that. Where other players would be like, you know, get that, get that, get out of here, man. You know, like they, they couldn't handle that, mm-hmm. you know. And we, we did that for each other uh, in those, those cup runs, in those cup years. And it's, I, I'll be honest with you, when I left Pittsburgh, I never really found it again. I, and in any other walk of life that, that this, this, I don't even know what it is. It's a different mentality. It's a different personality. It's a different breed of people mm-hmm. that are able to come together like that. And you kind of put all that, that ego, you know, on the back burner because you want to win so badly that you, you, you hold each other accountable. Like you talked about. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> eventually you, Gene Ubriaco comes to Pittsburgh, big advocate of yours, and uh, I think Bob Aries as well, and, and Troy's. And so, eighty eight, eighty nine, you get a, a chance to finally stick. All the effort is, is worthwhile. You had mentioned before you perhaps uh, are working out a little harder off off the ice. You're a National Hockey League player, bona fide. But the interesting thing about it is that that first year, eighty eight, eighty nine, I think Mario Lemieux had hundred ninety nine points. So. I always ask, I ask Peter Taglin, Eddie this, and Joey Mullen, just what is it like playing on the same team with Mario Lemieux? Well, that's the best way I can sum it up. And listen, I think we all appreciate what Wayne Gretzky did. And, you know, before that with Bobby Orr and Gordie Howe and Jean Beliveau. But I think for a lot of us in this age group that we're in, uh, between, say, 30 and 50, that, uh, you know, we think of Wayne Gretzky and Mario Lemieux. Gretzky was so incredible offensively. But to be quite honest with you, and yes, I'm a little biased, mm-hmm. Mario was a complete player. Mario could do it all. Mario could take big face-offs. He could kill penalties. He could block shots. He could, he could uh, you know, hit, play physical. However you wanted to play it, he could play it. And you're right, that year was, was magical that he had. And playing on the line with, with Robbie Brown, who had 49 goals that year, and Mario – with 199 points, it was an incredible run. And I'll tell you a quick story. Actually, before that, I came to training camp in the best shape of my life. I was in Pittsburgh all summer long, working out, finding rinks to skate at. First day of training camp, going off the ice. And Mario, we have a scrimmage game, and Mario's unbelievable. He's got about three goals and four assists in the scrimmage game. Mm-hmm. We're skating off the ice, and I come up to him. I tap him on the pads. I'm like, hey, big boy, you were, you were unbelievable. I said, I got to ask you. I've been in Pittsburgh all summer long. I haven't seen you in the gym, on the ice, anywhere. He goes, 
That's because this is the first time I've put my skates on. <laughs> I go, you got to be kidding me. So there's, there's kind of thumbs up. He was the epitome of the natural. You know, so much incredible talent and such a burning desire to win. Um, I don't know if we'll ever see another player at six foot five that could do what Mario Lemieux could do. No, he was a dream come true. It's like when you're your wildest dreams, your, the, the, the size, the skill. And I had, this, again, the same, a similar discussion with Peter Taglianetti from watching him in, in person on a nightly basis. You almost felt, I, I'll give you an example. The one night we were playing, uh, the St. Louis, the Penguins were playing St. Louis Blues, 1996. Long and short of it, his son Austin had been uh, born, I think, prematurely. So there were some, some questions right. about his health uh, for a while. And then everything was, was everything was fine. Uh, he, would, he would he was born healthy. Everything, and you can kind of see the weight off of Mario's shoulders. Uh, that first that night, he right. comes out. He gets a standing ovation. You know, the crowd's very emotional. And he comes out against the Blues that night. Uh, Gretzky, Grand Fuhr, and uh, scores five goals. And it seems like he could have scored ten. <laughs> but but it's always like this feeling I had with him. It's almost like yeah. he could do what he wanted to do on the ice. I didn't ever got that feeling from anybody else that I ever watched. Right. Yeah, that he could do the impossible. You know, five goals, five different ways. Um, and you think about the, the players that he played with, and that's the other part. Wayne Gretzky, throughout his career, played with other Hall of Fame players. And, and Mario did later in his career, you know, when Paul Coffey and Larry Murphy and Yager came along, Joey Mullen and Ronnie Francis. But, you know, really for the first, you know, five years of his career, he had to play with Phil Borks and Bob Eries and Troy Loney's, you know, and he, mm -hmm. he still put up ridiculous, ridiculous numbers. And, you know, it's well documented, you know, Warren Young, he scored 40 goals with Mario and Robbie Brown. And the list goes on of players that he, you know, made so great that never had that success again anywhere wherever they played. And, and also the Mario, the person, you know, he, mm -hmm. uh, he is such a, a, a gentle man. Uh, and just the way he carries himself, and, and he's such a loyal person, just, just a good heart, just a good person, and you never, ever, ever hear a bad word about something that Mario has done or a perception uh, of a person being around Mario, like, oh, geez, you know, I bumped in that love you at so-and-so place, and right. what a jerk he was. You never, ever hear that about Mario because he's, He's just such a kind-hearted person. And you can't fake that. And, you know, he, no athlete in the history of sports has had more of an impact on a city or community than he has, both on and off the ice. And it's actually incredible when you think about it all these years later, all he's done and how things have turned. But before we get there, I wanted to, you know, when, when you're talking to groups and you're talking to people about uh, – camaraderie, leadership. Uh, it, it reminds me of now it's 1999-1. It's a very interesting time to be a Pittsburgh Penguin. Um, you guys aren't having a great season. You've got Badger Bob Johnson as your head coach. Ultimately, it all comes together. But my, my question for you is, Is what did you learn? I didn't play with Badger Bob for a long time, but uh, what was the experience like uh, as, with him as the head coach? It's hard to believe he was only a head coach for the Pittsburgh Penguins for one year and then passed away in uh, November of 1991 after the Penguins won the Stanley Cup in May, on May the 25th of 1991. Right. Uh, and how he influenced so many players and so many people in this city. Uh, it, it's hard to really sum it up in, in only a few words on how positive he was and how much of a passion he had for hockey and how he was able to uh, read his team and read the opposition and make adjustments on the fly. And, you know, he was a guy that the simple things mattered to him about, about family, about being not only being a family as a teammate, mm -hmm. but including your family. He knew the names of your, your, your wife, your girlfriend, or your kids. He, he knew if you had a dog and uh, he knew if maybe your mom was sick or something like that. And he just really cared. And, um, you know, the one thing I'll never forget is, is you know, he he come up and he kind of put his hand on your shoulder and just kind of a, a soft tone. He'd be like, how you doing, Borky? How you doing today? You know, how you feeling? You know, and he, he kind of had this way about him. He'd be like, 
hey, I need you going. I need you going a little bit more. I'm going to need you. I'm going to need you down the stretch here. I'm mm-hmm. going to put you with Lemieux tonight. I'm going to need you going. I need <laughs> your wheels. I need you going a little bit harder. You know, you're, next thing you're thinking, you're like, yeah, get me <laughs> out there. I'm going to go through a brick wall, you know. But he, he was never a yeller, never a screamer. Uh, I don't even remember if I ever heard him swear. Uh, he was just such a unique human being that he loved the outdoors and he just he loved you know, we all think we love the game of hockey. Nobody, nobody loved the game of hockey like Badger Bob Johnson. That team pulls together, and I, I'm curious if you are, um, your recollection of, of one of the really, the, the 1991 and 91 to 92 Penguins teams, two of the great teams to ever play, and you're playing a huge role in those teams. But despite all that, in 1991, Lemuse hurt during the year. Uh, the club's kind of not really coming together. You make a series of trades during the year. Uh, Joe Mullen comes in, uh, Larry Murphy, uh, Tags we talked about, Grant Jennings, Ove Samuelson, and of course, Ryan Francis. And late in the season, things start to come together. Can you talk to me a little bit about, did you, at, at any point during that year, did you get that feeling of like, okay, now we have the pieces in place we are a legitimate Stanley Cup champion, and we're going we're gonna to win this thing. No. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not during the regular season. I mean, you, you kind of see some pieces, but most of us had never been there before. Uh, one guy that was a, kind of a real linchpin within our locker room as far as instilling belief and kind of steering us in the right direction and, and calming the seas, if you will, when things got rocky was Paul Coffey. Because mm-hmm. we knew Coff had, had won before with the Edmonton Oilers. So he was really the, the key guy. And a lot of us fell into line after him, as well as, you know, a guy that worked out like a madman after games, which was unheard of. That he would go in and he did this, uh, he had this routine with, with weights and, and bike and doing sprints and flushing the legs of the lactic acid. You know, this is stuff that was never heard of. It was unheard of back in the day. But it, it definitely helped us. Uh, down through the long stretch and into the playoffs. But, um, you know, it's funny. That's just the way the playoffs go, I think, is that uh, it doesn't matter who you are. You get through that first round and that, that power of belief, and you start seeing players get outside their comfort zone and do things in the playoffs that they wouldn't do uh, or, or weren't willing to do in the regular season, but they, they did it in the playoffs. That's what builds uh, a championship team. And we, we had a bunch of guys like that that knew how to step their game up uh, as the playoffs went on, slowly but surely, uh, we had a bunch of guys chip in. It wasn't just Mario. It wasn't just Coffee. Or it wasn't just you know Mark Recchi. Well, we we were able to roll four lines. And I tell you, you can look at that team in '91 or '92. You can even look at the Washington Capitals, Pittsburgh Penguins, Boston Bruins, and I bet you they'll tell you the exact same thing. That we had a bunch of characters that uh, weren't afraid to to speak their mind. Number one and number two, they knew. Uh, when there was a, a moment uh, during the regular season or more specifically in the playoffs when they had to step their game up and they did and they produced. What is that feeling like of winning the Stanley Cup? You're at, I mean, if the, the pictures are famous, uh, you're at Point Park, thousands of people deliriously happy. You've got that Stanley Cup. What is that experience like? Is it what you thought it would be? No, because you, what you have in your head was, you know, from, you know, when you're a 10 year old kid watching the Boston Bruins raise the Stanley Cup, and so you think you would know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we all kind of have that, uh, those dreams and those moments, uh, whether it's when you're asleep or when you're just daydreaming driving in the car, of, you know, as a as a young boy playing hockey, that we all dream of winning the Stanley Cup or playing road hockey or whatever. Uh, but until you actually uh, take that hunk of silver and, and put it over your head. It, it's a, it's an unreal moment. It, it becomes emotional when you first do it because especially for a guy like me that had to go through so much, mm-hmm. uh, so many ups and downs um, that it becomes a very emotional. And all of a sudden this, you know, 36, uh, 30 second movie goes off in your head of, you know, your, your, those moments with your dad, uh, you know, those moments of coaches yelling at you, those moments, you know, where somebody says, oh, that's so bork, he'll never make it, you know, that, that those all start firing off and little snapshots 
in your head. Uh, and that moment that you're referencing at Point State Park, they, uh, again, you just, you let it fly. You know, you just, you're, you're overcome with emotions <laughs> that you've never felt before. And, and so you try to harness them and, and either put it all in words or, or kind of carry yourself a certain way, but you really don't know what to do. You know, you just, you just hope you don't do anything stupid, I guess. <laughs> you, I think you had a, you had a, you're a memorable quote there, and I, I can't remember it. It was something, it wasn't that memorable for me. But I would say you had a memorable quote from that celebration. Do you, do you remember that? Well, that's what, what, kind of a funny story. Well, we, we were all asked to step up to the podium, to the microphone, and say something as we were introduced and handed the Stanley Cup. And some guys said nothing, but... When my turn was coming up, I was actually standing next to Mike Lang, and he, he kind of leaned over to me and whispered in my ear, said, hey, Borky, give him something to remember you by. And <laughs> so, that, you know, I was, I was up at the, the microphone, and I had no idea what I was going to say. And all of a sudden, I just blurted out, hey, let's take this down to the river and party all summer. And, and uh, <laughs> then I started right. jumping right. up and down and screaming or whatever. And the people went nuts, and all of a sudden, that became uh, – um, you know, a quote that's been repeated four times since then. Uh, <laughs> each time we've won the cup, I've re- repeated it at Point State Park. That's funny. That's great. Now, Phil, we're just about at the end of the time that I had requested, uh, but you have a couple minutes for a couple more questions. Of course. Yeah, sure. uh, thanks so much. So, um, I find it interesting when you, too, when you talk about leadership and things of that nature. The next year, under as you discussed, just incredibly tragic circumstances, Bob Johnson passes away in November of that year. Unbelievably emotional time in your organization. In to replace him comes the winningest coach in the history of hockey, Scotty Bowman, a much different personality. Can you talk a little bit about – now, that in itself is a – is a, uh, a lesson in adaptability. There's a team getting adapting to an entirely new personality as head coach. Can you uh, describe that circumstance for us? It, it was it was bizarre, to say the least. But yeah, you're right. Completely different personalities. That you know, here's a guy like Badger Bob Johnson I mentioned, putting his hand on my shoulder, talking to me like, you know, uh, you know, like your grandfather would. You know, mm-hmm. but. Uh, just had this uh, soft, easy way about him, but Scotty Bowman was completely different. He didn't, you, as a player, you didn't sense uh, that he wanted a relationship with you. It was basically, I'm the coach, you're the player. Uh, we don't need to be buddy buddy. I'll see you at the finish line. And <laughs> right. we're like, whoa, what, like, what's going on here? Um, and so I'll be honest with you that it was a bit of an oil water mix, and we floundered quite a bit during that 91 92 season as defending Stanley Cup champs until we had a, a big meeting out in Calgary uh, before that Western Canada swing. And it was in the hotel ballroom and Craig Patrick, our general manager called a meeting and basically let everybody stand up and speak their piece of, you know, why things weren't working and what was the problem with Scotty Bowman. And I just thought to myself, you know, sitting there listening to all my teammates, don't just sit there with your mouth shut, say something, say what's on your mind. And I did. And I, you know, after I, said a couple of things whether it's x's and o's or personality i i said to craig patrick i said craig i don't i don't think we can win the stanley cup with scotty bowman as our head coach wow holy smokes yeah the room went silent and i sat down craig who was just an unbelievable person and, and being able to absorb all this can you imagine sitting in the room and and you're having this meeting and he kind of addressed a bunch of the things that you know whether brian trache said something or or pete tagger and eddie uh, he addressed them, and he left uh, this for the last thing he said before he walked out of the room. He said, you know, I agree with what a lot of you guys said, and I'll go to Scotty, and we'll, we'll find a way. But the one thing I don't agree with, and he pointed right to me, and he said, what you said, Borky, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it. I, he, he said, I, I know we can win the Stanley Cup with Scotty Bowman, and we will win the Cup with Scotty Bowman, and he walked out of the room. Wow. And that's what, that was one of those moments, you know, where it's like, okay, Scotty's not going anywhere. Craig's going to go to Scotty, and we're going to find it. He's going to take two steps forward. We're going to take two steps forward. We're going to find a neutral ground, and we're going to get this done. And we did. We went on an unbelievable run at the end of the regular season, starting with that game in Calgary, and we ended up being back-to-back champs. Well, that's another great leadership lesson you just talked about, and I had not known about, about that, and that's – really says a lot, and it's a type of lesson that we talked about before to carry over uh, beyond hockey and into your life. 
but at the end of the season, uh, you have a unique situation at the time because you become a free agent and you have an opportunity now to uh, really make some, some real good money at the end of the year. It had to be somewhat of a mixed reaction. You get signed by the New York Rangers in the division, uh, a team that uh, you had quite a rivalry with, but you're leaving Pittsburgh at the peak. You're playing great. The team is at, the, at, its, at its highest uh, point, but you leave free agency. The, the, the contract's great with the Rangers, but I'm assuming there's got to be a little bit of a bittersweet uh, feeling for you at that moment. Absolutely. And it, it really came down. The first, actually, the first call I got on July 1st was from Mike Milbury from the Boston Bruins. Mm-hmm. It was early in the morning, and I'll never forget. He just said, I want to be the first one to call you because uh, I want you on my team. I was like, wow, really? I, I didn't <laughs> expect that. Uh, but anyway, it came down to the New York Rangers and actually the San Jose Sharks. And they offered me a four-year deal with some great money, more money than I ever made as a player to the point where I couldn't turn it down. And the Rangers stepped up and uh, bumped it up a little bit more. I wanted to stay on the East Coast. And I knew the Rangers had a good team. And I had a feeling they had a chance to win. And I, I really wanted to win another Stanley Cup. Uh, but you're right. There was uh, probably about two months into my time as a New York Ranger, I was – calling my agent saying hey is there any way you can get me back to pittsburgh and uh that never happened it's where my heart always was i never came back as a player thank god i'm able to come back as a broadcaster but yeah there was it it never worked out for me it was really um you know i ended up getting traded to the ottawa centers after that but yeah it was i'll I'll be quite frank just cut right to the chase i left for the money i left for that as a one chance i was 30 years old i was coming off of back-to-back Stanley Cups. I spent a lot of time in the minors. I felt it was, you know, my one kick at the can. And uh, I reached for the, you know, for the brass ring, so to speak. I went for the money, and uh, I wish I wish the Penguins had offered me more than just a 10% raise, but they had Tom Barrasso to sign, and, you know, Yager was going to be coming up, and they had three or four other guys that were ahead of me. And Craig Patrick even told me later on, I said, he goes, you had to take that deal because there's no way I would have come close to it. So, yeah. you know, we do what we do, and, you know, it, uh, it, it definitely it changed me as a person and a hockey player when I left Pittsburgh, for sure. Well, as you noted, it was a very unique, almost unduplicated uh, experience that you could have with the camaraderie, the talent, the, everything that you had, they had there. And the Penguins, you know, after 91-92, there were some losses there. You know, with the expansion, you end up losing uh, the Penguins, lost Troy Loney eventually, Bob Barry, those grit guys, those foot soldiers who could – uh, pretty much play the game any way you wanted to play it. I don't think that they ever really were able to. In fact, I know they weren't able to really re- to re- replace that and, and subsequently had a long gap between Stanley Cups. As you look back at your career, cause you played a long time. You played nearly 20 years because you, you played in, in Europe as well. You've talked about it uh, yeah. with Dave Molinari, the Pittsburgh Press, uh, on various occasions um, about concussions and uh, the role that you had some nasty and when I talk about your desire to make it in, in the big leagues, I think of some of the stories that you've, you've told over the years, uh, the concussion in Kingston, the way American Hockey League, when it sl- had to slammed against yeah. the boards in, in Hershey. Um, so we, we, this is a subject in and of itself, but we'll, we'll, we'll make it quick. When I l- see you on, on uh, the NHL Network, listen to you on the radio, um, talk to you now. Uh, you're same Phil Bork as always. Um uh, you know, sharp, humorous, funny, poignant. Uh, in your right now, in your life, do you have any effects and consequences of the way you played the game, which was all physical concussions were not diagnosed, you know, properly? We all know that. Um, is the are you suffering any any effects of that right now? Uh, I'm I'm not sure. You know, I I worry about it. Uh, I don't know if it's paranoia. I also wore a helmet that I never should have wore. It's a Jofa helmet. Mm -hmm. It was actually made for broom ball in Sweden. Uh, It didn't protect me at all. I had a bad climbing accident in 94 where I fell four stories down and, uh, you know, fractured my skull and had to get life flighted by a helicopter uh, to get uh, rescued. Uh, I broke my neck in five places and I was off the ice, but on the ice, I can remember being knocked out, knocked out cold many times. Um, But, you know, I worry a little bit about depression. I worry about, uh, you know, this, these long uh, moments of forgetfulness. Uh, I don't know about CTE. I don't know enough about it. 
to say that, you know, am I going to go into this downward spiral like like other players have? So, you know, there's just so many question marks. But, you know, the one thing I will say about it, just to kind of sum this subject up, is, you know, I, I played the game a certain way. I lived my life a certain way. It, it was who I was. Uh, the one thing I wish the, the league had done a better job of was protecting me from me. Right. And I still, to this day, I think they need to protect the players from the players themselves. Because, you know, when you're talking to 20 something year old kids that are, that are full of piss and vinegar and, and are willing to do anything. And I mean, anything to play in the national hockey league that I think the league needs to do a better job when it comes to equipment and uh, suspensions and, and the like and stuff like that, that should be unacceptable. But, you know, for me, uh, I'll be 57 in a little bit that, yeah, I, I do worry about the after effects. You know, am I going to go into these, uh, these downward spirals and, and depression that you hear so much about? I'm lucky to have a great job. I got a great family. I feel like my health is good. And um, I think because I'm still involved in the game, mm -hmm. I think that helps me avoid going down any of these rocky roads that you hear about a lot of other, not just hockey players, but athletes go down. You look like you're saying good physical shape as well. Are you working out consistently? Not consistently. I think I think I do the old just keep the uh, head above the old water line. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always pretty good about my diet and uh, you know taking care of myself. But you know I I work out sporadically just uh, to make sure my golf game stays good enough. <laughs> Absolutely. You mentioned <laughs> now we were working with Mike Lang. Uh, who him in him, his own right is a is a legend, and you know you were one of the most popular players to ever wear the 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 Penguins jersey. Of course, Mike was there well before you got there, and uh, was a legend. It must be a great experience to be able to work side by side with Mike. No, oh, it's the best, and uh, you know to be quite frank with you, Mike's health is not great right now. We right. don't really know what the future holds for him. We hope he can just do home games. I think we'd all be happy with that right now because the travel just takes too much out of him. But, mm -hmm. you know, Mike, is he's a, he's a living treasure is what, what he is right now. He's already in the Hockey Hall of Fame um, in the, uh, the, as a broadcaster, uh, and his calls are legendary. And he's, he's got the, the heart. Man, he's just such a good person. He's so, so uh, much like family to me. We have a great relationship outside the booth with – uh, I think carries over to our chemistry while we're calling games. And I love them. I love them to death. And I just can't imagine uh, they're not being, it's a hockey night in Pittsburgh, you know, with Mike Lang, you know, opening up a season and opening up games for the Penguins because he is, he's the voice of the Penguins. He's legendary. And uh, I catch myself quite often now that, you know, that his health isn't that great that I look over at him to my, I always, I always sit to his right. So I look to my left. Mm -hmm. And just say, God, thank you so much for blessing this guy and, and bringing him into my life. And I, I realize uh, I don't know how many more games he's going to do, but I cherish every single one I get to do with him. Well, that's a beautiful way to approach it. You know, when you look back at it, the people who've been with the organization for all five Stanley Cups would include just yourself, Mario, Steige, uh, Mike Lang, and Cindy Himes, of course. Um, and yeah. I, the, I think Patty Colson from the ticket office, who, who recently yeah, Carol, retired. Carol Colson. Yeah, yeah, that's Carol right, Carol Colson. And Jill Mawash. Jill Mawash, right. Uh, so uh, in the end, uh, Phil, you do, do, as you mentioned, you do a lot of speaking. And I was curious now, looking back at your career, we've talked about, uh, again, right from the beginning, challenges, goal setting, teamwork, camaraderie. What's, what do you want to leave? What, what message would you like to leave with kids when, when you talk to them about what they can learn from uh, your own life and your own career? Well, the one thing you can control is your work ethic. Uh, and there's one thing that I found that every winning team has a guy that's willing to be the hardest working guy on the ice. So that's one thing I try to instill in my son. 12-year-old uh, goaltender is to leave the ice uh, being the hardest working guy. So if there's just some scout or some coach up in the stands, you know, get his attention uh, by just by your work ethic. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you can get the hardest shot or the fastest skater, but if you're the hardest working guy and the other thing is, don't have any regrets. Don't have any regrets. Don't leave it all on the ice. And um, because 
you know, when it's over, it's over. And I just hear so many players, you know, that played the game and said, oh, I could have been this or I could have been that if I only did this or only did that. Mm -hmm. Go for it, man. Pour if, if it's not for you, then find something else. Do something else. But to, to get to a, a very high level at anything you do, you got to pour everything into it. You got to get up earlier than everybody else. You got to stay later than everybody else. You got to be willing to put the work in, no matter if you're a Sidney Crosby, if you're a Mario Lemieux, a Wayne Gretzky, or Phil Bork, a Bob Erie. It doesn't matter who you are. You got to put everything into it so that when you leave the game or you leave whatever thing you're doing, you can say, I got no regrets, man. I mm -hmm. gave it all. And I can say that about the game. 18 years, as you mentioned. I can say when the last day I laced my skates up, I knew that's it. I gave it. I, my, I gave you everything I had in my body. I got nothing left, and I have no regrets. I don't miss playing the game at all. I miss being around the game. That's why I love still being around it right now. But I know in my heart of hearts, I gave it everything I possibly had. And I think that's probably the message I would pass on to whether you're 5 years old, 15, 25, however old you are still playing the game of hockey – kind of decide tomorrow is the day I am going to pour everything into this game to try to be the best I can be. Very well said. And I am just jacked up just hearing that too. So that is awesome and <laughs> great. I really appreciate the time uh, today, yeah. Phil. Really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to talking to you for quite some time. And I really enjoyed watching you you play and uh, seeing your success post-career. So again, thanks so much for the time. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, this was fun. I really enjoyed it. It was good hockey talk. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast. Be sure to visit us at prohockeyalumni.org.